All right, so let's get started. Um, welcome, good morning, um, and uh, welcome to, uh, this is the second installment of PACE's Changing Minds webinar series. So I'd like to uh, welcome all of you, uh, and also welcome today's guest, Joe Gladue. Uh, Joe is uh, Product Marketing and Strategy with Teradov Digital Solutions and Mine RP. Uh, Joe's going to talk to us today a bit about the journey to the digital underground and uh, talk to us about the, the journey that uh, Dundee Precious Metals uh, took towards the digital underground as well. So uh, Joe's background is, uh, is pretty interesting. Um, he's worked in, uh, in business and technology for uh, more than 23 years globally. Um, in 2006 or since 2006, he's been working in mining for a number of global suppliers of, of connectivity, data solutions. Uh, he's been directly involved in uh, the scoping, sale, design and delivery of wire wireless connectivity in both soft and hard rock underground mines, as well as a number of open pit mines in uh, Canada, USA and uh, around the world. So uh, welcome, Joe. Thanks, Derek. Morning. Thanks Morning. for joining us. Yeah, so Joe, uh, I, I, I saw in talking to you earlier, you've got an interesting uh, way you sort of got into mining. Mining was not a first choice for you, but uh, uh, you've been you've been here for a while. So why don't you tell us about how you got into uh, mining technology? Mining uh, mining wasn't the first choice for me, and it's uh, it, it's interesting because I grew up in Sudbury, Ontario. For those of you that know Sudbury uh, and that are in the industry, you, you'd probably recognize Sudbury as, as somewhat of a, a technology epicenter as it relates to, to mining. So I grew up in Sudbury, went to university in Sudbury, uh, studied uh, business to be an accountant of all things. Imagine that out there. And uh, yeah. decided accounting wasn't for me, so I switched and uh, got into computer science. So that's how I, I got into the technology side of the business. So really the first part of my life had nothing to do with mining. Uh, as a lot of young Sudbury guys do, they graduate university and they bolt for the big city. And that's exactly what I did in about 95. So I went to Toronto, started my career with Hewlett Packard and worked with a number of technology companies that were focused on network security, uh, server system management, uh, high performance distributed computing, some really cool complex stuff. And uh, I had the opportunity to move back to my hometown which I did in, uh, in about 2005, and was telecommuting to Toronto. So I was running global services for a network security company, and I said, you know, if I'm going to be based here in Sudbury, I might as well look for something in Sudbury. And I uh, picked up the local newspaper one day and came across this interesting ad for an Australian-based company that provided wireless connectivity to underground mines. Now, as a technology guy, I thought, well, okay, this can't be that difficult. I've been in technology for a dozen years. I'm reasonably good at it. Um, I've traveled around the world. I've got some good experience. How hard can this little mining thing be? Um, it was pretty difficult. And I uh, responded to the ad. I uh, was lucky enough to get the interview. Um, I, uh, I had the business background they were looking for. I had the technology background. And although I knew nothing about mining, um, I lived in an area that had an underground mine under my basement. So at 5.30 every day when they would blast, I would feel the percussion and not really realize what was going on. And it wasn't until years later that I got into the industry that I really started to understand what mining means. So it was uh, it was kind of a, a long journey. And uh, to be perfectly honest, when I got into the industry, it isn't one that I thought I'd spend a lot of time in. Um, mining, as I'll talk about in the adoption of technology, uh, advances very, very slow. Mining, I think, is recognized as being laggards in terms of their adoption of new technology. So I found it quite frustrating. But the part of me that enjoys a challenge thought, you know, if I can get the mining industry to wrap their heads around what the potential of uh, connectivity and wireless communications can mean, maybe there's there's some upside. Um, and that's kind of how I fell into it. So Great. That's fantastic. Appreciate that. Okay, Joe, so we'll, uh, we've had a few more uh, joiners. I'll just remind everybody again, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat function in your um, webinar window, uh, and uh, we will try to get to those questions as we go through the presentation. So with that, uh, Joe, I will uh, hand it over to you to uh, take control. 
Okay, perfect. Thank you. So again, thanks everyone for joining. Um, I'm going to take about the next 45 minutes or so to to really share with you uh, my journey in, in mining, specifically around providing technology solutions. Give you a bit of context of where I started 12 years ago. Some of the the painful lessons that, that we learned, really being innovators and pioneers in terms of bringing this technology to underground mining. Um, it, it, it kind of look at where the state of the industry is today, uh, which is a lot better than what it was 12 years ago when I got into it. So part of that is I want to share with you uh, a little bit of experience that I gained over the last year and a half um, with Dundee Precious Metals. And I'll tell that story uh, in a bit of detail to give you some context as to what I do today with Mine RP, who Teradive is, and what's that relationship with, with Dundee. So um, I'm going to use Dundee as somewhat of a case study to talk about what can be with, uh, with digital connectivity as part of enabling digital transformation in mining. So this is a topic that's, uh, that's very, very relevant in t uh, today, and uh, this is how Derek and I actually came to meet, is, uh, is through uh, different seminars in their Beyond Digital Transformation session they ran in several few months back. So... I'll see if I can advance this slide. There we go. So I'm a, I'm a management consultant uh, specializing in underground communication, or at least I was a management consultant specializing in underground communication, and spent the last year and a bit working for Dundee Precious Metals. Uh, Dundee, uh, as many of you know, had this wonderful success story of implementing uh, digitization in their mine in Chalapach. And uh, the, the outcomes to the business were actually quite impactful. And I saw this as an opportunity to work with them to get a better understanding of the inside workings of a mining organization and how they make decisions around the business requirements for this sort of technology versus coming from the supplier side where I had a shiny box that did some really cool things, but maybe I didn't fully understand the context and the applicability in the industry. So what's interesting about Dundee's journey is... Um, they had such great success with the technology, they spun off this company called Teradive Digital Solutions. And this is when I joined them to help commercialize and bring this technology to market. Um, late last year, they, uh, or mid last year, they were evaluating the other side of the ecosystem, the other side of all this connectivity, and really the acquisition of data, and how you can use the data to drive better decision making and really get a better understanding as to how your mind is performing. So they came across this independent software vendor based out of South Africa named MineRP with uh, at that time a 20-year track record in really um, being experts in mining, being experts in the, uh, the technology, the science of mining, and having a good understanding of the business uh, that, that relates to mining. You're really connecting the two of them. So MineRP is essentially uh, an independent software vendor. They're a Canadian company since their acquisition uh, by Dundee Precious Metals back in October last year. Based in South Africa, we do have a presence uh, in Canada, in uh, South America, and Australia. And it's a 21-year it's company. So we just celebrated our 21st anniversary uh, last week. We're about 170-some-odd employees. Um, as a software vendor, uh, which is what they were primarily, um, now they have a hardware component to, to their business. And that's where Teradive has kind of come into play and, and where I have come into play to help them on the product strategy for the connectivity and the hardware piece of the business that enables and assists them with gathering data that's used within the MineRP framework. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, what that framework looks like a little later on into the presentation. So that's a bit about mine RP. Now, to put this into context, and I'm just waiting for my slides to advance here, Derek. There we go. I want to give you a bit of a, a timeline. So many of you have probably heard of Dundee Precious Metals, or you've uh, you've watched Rick Howe speak, or you've uh, seen a video that he's spoken at, or read one of the articles that he's been published in uh, across many uh, trade publications in the industry. Uh, but Rick, and uh, in a more term that, that, that I picked up from uh, Pace's Beyond Digital Transformation session uh, a few months ago, was kind of termed the godfather of uh, mining digitization. And I couldn't think of anyone uh, more appropriate than Rick. And it really has to do with their digital journey 
and that's what I want to kind of elaborate on is, uh, you know, what their journey looked like, ooh, what were the different challenges with that, where are the opportunities. And it really all began at Dundee back in 2003 when they acquired um, an old bankrupt mine, Soviet area mine um, uh, in Bulgaria, of all places. So Dundee was really a, uh, they were a, uh, an investment firm, they were a wealth management firm. They didn't own any mines and in 2003 they decided to get into the industry and actually purchase a mine. So when they bought the mine in 2003, they had a lot of work ahead of them. Uh, they hired a, a fellow by the name of Rick House, and Rick was really instrumental in, in various roles, starting as the general manager and then moving to the chief operational officer, and then ultimately to the CEO to turn this little mine around and really uh, allow them to achieve some great things, partially as a function of changing their, uh, changing their mining method. But really, a big part of their success had to do with Rick's vision. And Rick had this, uh, this, this concept that he coined, taking the lid off the mine. And the thinking was, mining can't continue the way that it is. It's incredibly inefficient. Uh, you've got you know, two or three hundred guys that go down the hole every day. They've got work assigned to them. You have no idea what's going on. No visibility or transparency into uh, any delays or problems that occur after the shift. And in some cases, you don't know about it until several days later, at which point it's too late to, to, to course correct. So Rick had this view that if we could somehow take the lid off the mine by providing connectivity, and through that connectivity have the ability to see what was going on, the ability to communicate in near real time with the people underground, push instructions to them, understand uh, and, and have a feedback mechanism to understand any sort of delays or any sort of variability, and provide that holistic view in a central control room type environment, now you have the ability to really optimize and, and, and tweak the performance of your operations. So they did that. In 2009, they kicked off their digital journey. Uh, it was about a three-year journey where they digitized the mine, and that digitization journey involved installing a series of wireless access points, uh, network switches, voice over IP phones, RFID tags, tracking software, and uh, a different technology from an ecosystem of partners uh, that allowed them to implement short interval control and build that feedback loop to get an understanding of what's happening in their underground rock factory. So that project, that journey really started in 2009. Uh, the first phase of that concluded uh, three years later. And uh, over the course of that time, they were able to reduce their cost by about 50%. So that was, uh, I forget the exact number, in excess of $60 million a year. They ultimately quadrupled their production from 500,000 tons per year to 2.2 million tons a year in 2016. They provided better transparency and visibility uh, into their operations. And uh, as Rick will often say, this journey allowed them to get a very easy 30 to 50% improvement uh, just by digitizing the mine. So uh, Rick would be the first to tell you this is the tip of the iceberg. And the next part of the journey is based on the, the, the building blocks of what they put in place in Shellopetch back in 2009. So since that, obviously, Rick uh, got uh, a lot of press. They had a lot of people that were impressed with what they did, and it was quite impressive because they weren't a major. They were this little wee junior gold mine that set up shop in 2003 in Bulgaria of all places, and they made it work. And let me see if I can advance that slide again. There we go. So since they kicked off their, their taking the lid off journey in 2009, they've had over 50 different mining companies come to visit them. Uh, a lot of majors, a lot of mid-tier and a lot of juniors, just to understand how did these guys do it? How did they, did they do this in Bulgaria? How did they manage the implementation of the technology, the selection of the technology? Uh, how did they get the people to accept this technology and get those results. So it's really an inspirational story. And, you know, if I take a step back and I look at my own journey in mining that started in about uh, 2006, I got into the industry not really knowing anything about the industry, but I was a technology guy. So, you know, my predecessor said, don't worry about mining, we'll teach you mining. And uh, we did a reasonably good job at selling solutions into the industry in 2006 up to about 2008 when the global financial crisis hit and uh, connectivity and Wi-Fi was not a must-have. It wasn't uh, part of the infrastructure. It was a nice-to-have. So we had some real challenges back then. 
So because of the success that they had at Chelopetch, um around 2015, the board at Dundee Precious Metals said, listen, you know what, we're running a mine. Um, there's a lot of people interested in what we've done. Why don't we take the opportunity and try to commercialize some of the success, success that we've had? And we use that commercialization to not be a technology player, but really to transform the industry and use this as kind of a jumping off point for uh, other organizations to leverage the same sort of technology. And maybe we can sell this. Uh, but at a minimum, what we want to do is we want to challenge the thinking or the traditional thinking of mine operators around the globe that they need to do something different. So Territive Digital Solutions was uh, officially kicked off at Mine Expo in 2016. Um, I joined them as a consultant uh, early 2017, and uh, we really began the commercialization journey of taking that technology that they had and bringing it to market. Now, what was interesting about their journey is the technology was not fit-for-purpose uh, industrial equipment. The view that Rick and his team had is, you know, when they started this, they had a relatively small budget. It was about $100,000. You can't light up a mine for $100,000. So what he said is, listen, we'll spend hundred thousand dollars. We're going to buy commercial off the shelf, te uh, commercial off the shelf technology. We'll provide the mechanical protection, the environmental protection, to make it fit for purpose. So that should lower our overall cost in terms of the investment for the technology. They did make some uh, specific developments themselves. They built some custom antennas that allowed them to get really good signal propagation in their mind. Uh, they built this great little device that allows them to extend Wi-Fi connectivity to the face and into the stove. And then they customize off-the-shelf solutions. So their view was, we don't want to spend a million dollars to light up the mine, but we'd rather take proven best-of-breed technology. Let's put our own ruggedization on it, and let's build something that works for us. Let's prove the concept out. And they did that. They proved it out, and then the, 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 the journey kind of expanded to, to where they're at today. And I'll talk about what that footprint looks like. So that was really the inspiration for uh, for launching Teradive. Um, mid last year, they they met a great South African organization that uh, was focused on the use of the data. So Rick had laid the foundation. Let's get the plumbing in place. Let's make sure that we have connectivity where it matters most. Let's make sure that we understand what's going on and we have that feedback loop. And let's collect a bunch of data. But without context, without understanding uh, the impact of that data as it relates across multiple disciplines within the mining uh, sphere, um, it really isn't of much value. So they were looking for that, that, that missing link, and this is where MinerP came into play. They liked the solution so much they bought the company, and the, uh, the agreement was, uh, was structured uh, summer last year, and it was late October when it was finalized. So it was really a, a quick courtship and a quick marriage. And uh, when the acquisition was, was completed, it was about a 78% acquisition of MineRP, which now becomes a Canadian organization, uh, merged that with Teradive, and the new organization known as uh, uh, MineRP Holdings uh, would be the vehicle for uh, selling the MineRP uh, enterprise solution and also for moving the connectivity components that enable the MineRP solution. So that's kind of a long story that explains the evolution from Dundee to Teradive to MineRP and the subsequent merger of, of the two organizations together. So what I found interesting when I got into the industry, and again, I'll, I'll kind of take you back to 2006. I'm a technology guy, and uh, I wasn't a Wi-Fi expert, but you know, part of the value proposition for this Australian-based company that I joined uh, that was focused on solutions for mining was about providing connectivity. And that connectivity could be in the form of uh, ultra-low frequency through the earth communication. Uh, in some cases, it was leaky feeder for voice communications. But there was this new thing that they were bringing to the industry. And the new thing wasn't really that new. It was this thing called Wi-Fi that I had used in, uh, in my Bay Street job for the previous 12 years. And I thought, you know, this is pretty easy. I can put Wi-Fi in my house and, um, you know, my house, I've got the access point in the basement. I struggle to get signal propagation up in the bedroom, so I move the access point. Or maybe I put a second access point. Easy problem to solve. I've been involved in working with small regional offices where they said, hey, Joe, you're a technology guy. What should we do to put Wi-Fi in the building? Well, pretty straightforward. If you look at the image on the right-hand side, this is a typical small office, and it probably has two access points. And the green is where you have great signal propagation and, and, and great Wi-Fi coverage. 
in the areas that are red is where you may not have great coverage. So it, it, it's a reasonably easy thing to deploy in a small environment. So what I didn't know about mining, and uh, it wasn't until I uh, went into my first underground uh, soft rock mine in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, believe it or not. It was a salt mine, 1,000 meters below uh, the lake. Uh, it's kind of the base of this big metropolitan city. And uh, it was a little different from what you see here. They were a single horizon mine, so it was one level. And compared to what you see on this slide, relatively easy to get uh, coverage. But if you take a typical massive uh, hard rock mine with multiple levels and declines and maybe multiple shafts and you've got uh, stopes, depending on the mining method, it's difficult to get pervasive Wi-Fi in this sort of environment. And it was a very painful lesson that we learned uh, in the first few years as we started to be pioneers and innovators to bring this technology to market. So we learned a lot about the design, the proper design of a Wi-Fi network. We learned a lot about uh, the black magic that uh, is uh, RF, signal propagation. We learned a lot about attenuation and reflection and the challenges of how to get the right coverage in the right areas to support the right applications that support the right business tools that impact your business. So that's really, uh, I think, part of the journey over the last 12 years. So again, I'll take you back to my days um, in 2006 working for this uh, Australian company that had really great technology and, uh, and the success that we had. And again, 2006, the, the mining industry was booming. For those of you that were around and recall, uh, nickel was trading around $23, $24 a pound. Uh, there was lots of money going around. So you know, the interest in technology, specifically this sort of technology to improve mining, wasn't really there. But there's this thing called the technology adoption life cycle. And this is not necessarily applicable to mining technology. It's applicable to technology in general. And the technology adoption life cycle represents uh, how people adopt new technology. And again, for those of you that have been in mining for a while, um, hand on heart, you can say that mining is not typically known for being innovative in terms of the adoption of new technology. And this was interesting to me in 2006 when um, I got into the Wi-Fi business and I thought, well, this is easy, everyone knows Wi-Fi. But the mining industry was very, very conservative. So they are what I would consider laggards if you look at kind of the, the sphere of this thing back in 2006. So in general, the technology adoption life cycle is kind of broken into these, these groups. And the groups uh, represent when they adopt technology. So the first group is uh, the innovators. These are the guys that stand in line to get the latest iPhone. Uh, the day before it releases. They don't need a new iPhone. They don't care uh, about the justification for it. They just want shiny new things. It's cool. It's neat. This is what I want to have. I'm one of those guys. I'm, I'm a bit of a nerd and I like technology. And that was part of the appeal of coming into the industry. The next phase that you have is the early adopters. The early adopters is where I would categorize where the mining industry is, is, is right now. And by and large, I'd say that the mining industry... Uh, for the most part, wants to be the first to be second. They want someone else to be the early, the, uh, the innovators. They want someone else to prove out the technology before they decide to make that investment. Uh, then you've got the early majority. So they're a little bit later to the party, but they're adopting this technology really as it kind of hits the, the pinnacle of, uh, of its market share. And then you've got the late majority, and then ultimately you've got the laggards. Right? These are the guys that uh, only buy rotary phones or, or only buy push push tone phones because they can't get the rotary phone anymore. So you look at this in mining, and I've kind of overlaid some of the technology. In 2006, I think the reason that we had great success, the industry was booming. There was lots of money to be spent. There was R&D money to be spent. It wasn't difficult to get $100,000 to go and try stuff. And we had a number of customers that had budgets to go and try stuff. They were the innovators. So we aligned ourselves with the decision makers, and they were IT managers. They were uh, folks that were tasked with R&D and uh, innovation. And it was easy to, get, to sell them because they were already sold. The problem that we really found is when you got to about 2008, and in 2008, Wi-Fi was nice to have, but I sure didn't need it. And when we're cutting people and bonuses don't exist anymore and we're, we're putting mines in care and maintenance, we're not going to invest in Wi-Fi. So that was, I think, the hard reality that all of the suppliers in mining uh, that provide this sort of solution were really faced in that 2008-2009 era. 
and it lingered for us for, for, for quite some time. So as a uh, provider of this technology, we kind of fell back on the traditional technology, the leaky feeder, and the benefits that it provided. And there are certainly benefits to leaky feeder, which is probably the most predominant technology that you'll see for communications in underground mining. Um, and then an interesting thing happened probably two years ago. Um, Dundee Precious Metals, of course, have been on this journey since 2009, 2012. Um, I heard about this little gold mine in Bulgaria that put Wi-Fi and they were getting all kinds of press and great articles about it, and it bugged me. It bugged me because they didn't buy my solution. They did it themselves, and they had tremendous success. And in retrospect, having sat inside of Dundee Precious Metals for the last year and a half, I can tell you it had very little to do with the technology. It had to do with the vision of a guy by the name of Rick House. It had to do with the vision of the CEO that's been in the industry for 35 years that knew we can't continue to run mines the way that we run them. And that really started to unlock the realization that we've got to do something different in the industry. It started to unlock the realization that, you know, maybe this technology that guys like Joe Gladue and others have been, you know, running around uh, trying to evangelize since 2006 have some merits to help us transform our business. So we saw this uptick a couple of years ago, and I think Barrick was probably one of the first ones to put a stake in the ground, and they made that major announcement that we're going to invest $100 million to digitize our, our, our minds and transform our minds. And it, it was a phenomenal story. And we're starting to see a lot more people jump onto that bandwagon now and realize that we need to do something different. And technology is not the cure for the industry, but it's going to provide the building blocks and the foundation for what's going to enable that digital transformation. So that's what I'll say about the uh, the adoption life cycle and really you know part of the journey that that, that, that I endured uh, starting back in 2006. So um, about a year ago, I, I discovered this uh, this entrepreneur and this uh, this author by the name of Simon Sinek. And for those of you that know Simon Sinek and, and, and read his work, it's uh, it's really it's thought provoking. It's not rocket science, but it really, for me, it gave me um, gave me pause to take a step back and, and, and look at my career over the last 12 years in trying to provide digital solutions to the industry and what worked and what didn't work. And I had the tremendous privilege of sitting inside of the walls of Dundee Precious Metals for the last year and a half, and I probably spend more hours on the sofa in Rick Howe's CEO of Dundee Precious Metals office than, than most other people. And I asked him just a lot of dumb questions. Help me understand why you guys did this. What did you do? And what I came to realize is Rick understood what Simon Sinek uh, discovered about his own journey of, of, of kind of, you know, uh, what drives organizations and what drives individuals. And it's this thing called the golden circle. So the golden circle describes the why, the how, and the what people do, what motivates people, what they do, and how they do it. And I looked at this from an organizational perspective, and I said, okay, well, when I was at my first organization, uh, I was very good at describing what we did. We made super cool, ruggedized access points with these quick connectors, easy to install, and I could rhyme off two pages of, of uh, speeds and feeds and great um, uh, technical things that the innovators loved. If I went to see Rick House with that, he'd say, I don't care, so what? You sell an access point. So do 50 other people. So I was able to describe how we were able to implement the systems and the approach that we took, and that was great, and that resonated with some people, but it wouldn't resonate with a guy like Rick House. Because Rick House doesn't care about what the box looks like. He doesn't care about the cable. To some extent, he cares about how easy it is to manage the system. He certainly cares about the price, but what he cared about was the why. Why he put this technology in his mind had nothing to do about technology. He recognized that their why, their vision, their passion for what they needed to do was the industry was in dire straits. They were in big trouble, and they had to do something different. They cannot sustain the way that they're operating today. And that's really why I referenced the Golden Circle and Simon Sinek. It's been something that's really been a, a good compass for me as a business guy, as a supplier of technology solutions, and being able to relate to my customers and understand their journey and articulate the value proposition that we bring to the industry. And, and, and I drew this from Rick and Simon Sinek. So 
Rick, I don't know if you read Simon Sinek, but he articulates these exact same values. So let me advance and let me kind of tether that against the technology adoption curve that you see in the lower right hand uh, side. So if you look at the success that we have with the innovators, it had nothing to do with the why. It was purely about the how and the what. If I look at the challenges that we had, uh, for me personally, I think we didn't have a very good understanding of our customers' why, the industry's why, and if we couldn't articulate that, we didn't have alignment with Rick's passion and Rick's vision. Um, we weren't able to, to really advance the cause as much as we want. And realistically, the industry wasn't ready for the technology. We're slightly farther up the curve. I don't think we're in the early majority, but we're certainly approaching that. And the industry, by and large, recognizes they've got to do something different. That's their why. How they do that might be Wi-Fi. It might be LTE. It might be some other technology. But regardless of the technology, the motivation and the passion for why they do it is well understood and very clearly articulated. So let me take you down Dundee's journey. And, and the way that I approach this is, you know, through spending a lot of time with Dundee and spending a lot of time with Rick, I tried to unpack uh, what the golden circle was for them. And, 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 and some of these are, are Rick's statements, and these are, um, I think, statements that we also made when we kicked off the, the Territive Digital Solutions business. This was our why. Our why was we're in the business of providing connectivity solutions, not because they're cool connectivity solutions, not because the boxes look neat or they're easy to manage or maintain. Those are hows and those are whats. But the why was the industry really needs to change. That was the impetus for what uh, Rick uh, set out to do. So Rick very clearly articulated, listen, you know, we're mining guys. We're not technology guys. We understand the challenges of mining. We understand there's a, there's a ton of uncertainties. From exploration where you delineate what you think is the ore body, you don't really know until you get down there and you start to move rock that you realize the ore body doesn't look like what, what we thought it would. Uh, or maybe you know we're not able to advance the mine the way that we thought because of, of, of issues uh, with the rock strata or, or um, you know, because of equipment failures and, and things of that nature. Uh, the grades are declining, so the deeper they go, the grades aren't as great as they were uh, years ago. The costs are going up. The environments are pretty difficult. Open pit is difficult. Uh, underground is really difficult, particularly when you get into implementing these sorts of technologies. And the complexity, I think, really increases significantly depending on your mining method, depending on what you're mining, and the sort of challenges that that presents with signal propagation, with installation, with uh, ground stability, and so on. Mining by, uh, by nature is incredibly variable. And uh, if you participate in any of these short interval control workshops, uh, such as uh, things that have been facilitated by, by, by PACE or the Canadian Mining Innovation Council, uh, managing that variability, I think, is probably the greatest motivation for why you want to implement technology to understand the variability and deal with that variability, variability in near real time. And that really, I think, is the opportunity for, for the industry. Um, mining is very uh, people driven, it's very process driven, and when you have a lot of people involved, the chances of things not going right are, are increased. Um, uh, you know, further than that, you look at the different disciplines involved in mining. You know, you've got engineers, you've got surveyors, you've got geologists, uh, you've got health and safety, you have environmental people. They all have a mandate, they have data that they use to make decisions, but a big part of the problem, and it's part of the problem that, that Dundee recognized, and part of the problem that MineRP is really working hard to solve, is breaking down these silos of data. And bringing all the data together so that you have a holistic view of what's happening within your organization, and you can apply that knowledge to make better decisions. So again, these were the whys for, 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 um, for Dundee Precious Metals. And I'll get into... Uh, couple other aspects. I won't go into this uh, in great detail, but it really speaks to the state of mining today. And that kind of represents uh, kind of the three core dimensions of, 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 of mining. There's, there's the planning, there's the execution, and there's this notion, this notion of, of improvement. Uh, I'm not a mining guy, but I spent a lot of time around mining guys, and, and I've heard the same story from everyone that I've talked to, every mine manager, every executive, is they do a reasonably good job at planning based on the limited information that they have. And therein lies the opportunity. Right? You have to make a whole bunch of decisions and assumptions based on things that are not necessarily proven until you get down there. When it comes time to execute, things always go wrong. 
And when they go wrong, it really puts you behind your plan. And, and it's, it's, it's a problem that isn't unique to Dundee Precious Metals. It's a unique, it, it, it's, it's a problem that really, I think, plagues the entire industry if these things aren't well balanced. So because the execution uh, doesn't always go according to plan, um, you're always playing catch up. And that in turn affects planning and it certainly impacts the ability to improve. Whereas if you talk to an executive like uh, like Rick, he'll tell you what you really should have is a very well-balanced uh, plan. You have a very well-balanced execution and a continuous improvement cycle that feeds into this, this feedback loop. As you execute and you collect data on your progress, what's working, what isn't working, that feeds back into the planning process. And this is where MineRP uses the data in the context that we're able to collect over the infrastructure into the MineRP framework to really be quite agile in that planning and adjust the planning, the planning dynamically based on what's actually happening underground. So it's a bit of a, a paradigm shift in the thinking, but this is the goal for where the industry needs to head. So this was uh, Dundee's kind of initial view on, on, on taking the lid off the mine, right? So taking the lid off really spoke to uh, the concept of, you know, we've got this underground rock factory. We have no idea what goes on underground. We, we, we send the guys down the hole every day. They've got their marching orders. Uh, we don't find out until the end of the day that stuff didn't get done. Uh, if something didn't get done, you know, people tend to try to cover what happened. Uh, just say, hey, listen, it's not my fault, we couldn't find the equipment, or so-and-so didn't show up. There's lots of excuses. It's it's the BS factor that, that Rick talks about. So, you know, that initial vision of, 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 the, of the how for Dundee was, was exactly this. On the left, you've got the old way, paper reporting, uh, you know, uh, very little interaction with uh, shift supervisors or shift bosses and the underground crew, lots of firefighting, you know, small picture view, silos of data, and so on. In Rick's view is if we could implement some kind of technology that allowed us to have a continuous feedback loop. So if you look at the applications that break out of that within the sphere of, of digitization, there's things like asset tracking, right? Where are my people? Where is my equipment? Um, rather than have paper, why don't we go with tablets? And why don't we provide uh, digital reason codes that get sent back up to surface? And all of this information goes to uh, what some are calling an integrated operations center or, or an IROC or a smart center or a central control room. And the, the idea is that within that central control room, you have it staffed with the people that have a good understanding of the overall business. And when something happens, they have the information that they need to make a decision and do something different. So you don't get caught behind the eight ball. You make the best of what you can in the situation you can see the entire chess board and you can move the pieces on the board because you can see what's going on. That's taking the lid off. That was the concept. And really what that broke out to is, is to be the implementation of what uh, many are talking about today as short interval control. So that was really the initial impetus and, uh, and, and the how. So taking the lid off. This is what uh, inspired um, um, the board of Dundee to, to uh, take this little technology division and let's bring it to market. They had enough people that said, listen, we want to buy Chelpetch. Now, the, <laughs> the reality is you can't buy Chelpetch in a box. Uh, we can help you with the solutions. We can help you with the technology, the connectivity piece, the voice over IP, the RFID, uh, all that good stuff. But really, it, it's not about the technology. The, the technology is, is purely the enabling component but it really comes down to the why. It comes down to understanding the problem that you're trying to solve, making sure that you have the support and the commitment for, from the entire team to make this change. And it comes down to change management. Derek and team can speak to this uh, far more effectively than I can. But that was really, I think, the recipe for success at, uh, at, at Dundee. So it's interesting. When we kicked off Teradev in 2016, we really formally launched this thing in MineX, we brought it to market. We thought we're going to sell everything that we put in place at, at, at Chelmfetch. And, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about what that technology was just to give you uh, an idea of, of their thinking at the time and the approach. And then uh, I'll tell you a little bit about how we, we've changed our view a little bit on our approach to market. And some of our competitors will be happy about it. Um, 
but it really speaks to, I think, a theme that I've seen emerge in the last uh, six to 12 months, and that's the theme of collaboration. Um, when I was a supplier in 2006, uh, there's no way I would talk to a competitor. There's no way. Um, and in hindsight, what we've all come to recognize, the mining uh, organizations have come to recognize that they can't do it alone. So now you have majors that are talking to, to each other. You've got Glencore that talks to Valet and they're sharing best practices. That didn't happen a year ago. It didn't happen two years ago. It certainly didn't happen in 2006. You have ecosystem partners uh, providing technology that are collaborating and picking what lane they stay in to provide the solution to the industry. So we're seeing a big change on the supply side and uh, on the, uh, the mining side. So this slide represents um, the Teardive Digital Backbone. This is very representative of what you would see if you went to Chelapech. It's a very simple diagram that uh, represents the major components that Dundee implemented. And I'm going to start on surface. So uh, Dundee uh, is now a decline access, but they do uh, have uh, shafts that are no longer used. So they've got fiber that comes down to the underground workings. It's, uh, it's a hard rock mine, multi-horizon, so they've got fiber that breaks out in different levels. And uh, part of their view is that they were going to take the lid off the mine, that they were going to provide that transparency and the transparency and uh, data acquisition and visibility was so critical to the operation. This network had to be highly available. So that means if they lost mains power, that network still had to work. If someone cut a piece of fiber, the network had to work. If someone cut one of the power cables, it had to work. So they put a lot of thought into the criticality of the infrastructure and they designed uh, a system that looks something like this. So you've got fiber that kind of comes down the shaft and comes out to a level. And uh, there, there's several uh, of these represented at, at, at Chelopech, but again, this is a very simple diagram. On the left-hand side, you'll see these two gray boxes that sit side by side. This is uh, power rectifiers. So essentially, this is a power distribution center for a segment of the network. And the reason that we have two is if one fails, it automatically fails over to the other one. If mains power fails, then we have battery backup for each one of these. And there are eight of these at Chelopech. So they've got kind of eight different rings throughout their ore body with redundant power. So you don't have a single point of failure. Uh, and when you do lose the mains power, you can run a battery backup for about seven days, which is actually pretty impressive. They went with a centralized power distribution scheme rather than a decentralized scheme. And there's pros and cons to each approach. Uh, it's a single point of, of, of isolating the power versus having to travel across you know, 50 kilometers of drift to various uh, power supplies to, to isolate power. Is one better than the other? I, I think there's, there's merits on both sides. This is one that they chose. The blue boxes, the big blue boxes that you see with kind of the orange outline around them, those are what we call the uh, communications gateway. And the communications gateway is uh, part of the power distribution. So each one of these comms gateways provides uh, a power demarcation for access points and other PoE devices that can hang off of it. And it also, you'll see, it forms a bit of a loop. So if you cut the power from one direction, we automatically fail over and feed the power from the other side. Now, likewise, they also provide a fiber demarcation and a common part for a fiber to come in so that if you sever that fiber on one side of the comms gateway, we feed the network from the other side and so on. So there's a series of redundant uh, fiber loops and a series of redundant power loops deployed across the mine. The little uh, blue box that, if you're a Star Wars fan, almost looks like uh, a, a TIE fighter uh, is actually a ruggedized access point. It's really a, an enclosure that was designed by, by Dundee and actually uh, one of their contractors uh, that, that, that built these boxes and they've got these neat masts that hold these antennas that allow them to, to move the antennas in different directions. So it gives a really good control over the directionality of the antennas and the antennas don't kind of sway, which affects the RF signal propagation and what they call the Fresnel zone. Um, so they put a lot of thought into that design. But inside of that enclosure, they actually use just a low cost commercial off the shelf access point that isn't ruggedized that I would install in this office right here. In fact, it's the, it's the exact same ones, but we're repurposing them and they're a fraction of the cost of what it would be to buy a full industrial one. 
If you kind of look along uh, the rest of the diagram, you'll see a few other things in there. We see this little cartoon guy walking around with a tablet. Uh, DPM's got a bunch of tablets that they use for short interval control. Their morning lineup is more about safety, and then the guys go down to their vehicles on their tablets, they get their tasks for the day. And they go through and they'll update their progress on the tablets. That feedback comes up to the central control room and they can see if there's any problems and reassign the guys or reassign vehicles because they know what's going on in near real time. There's a little wee yellow thing, that's actually a, a white phone. So uh, they did have leaky feeder and they still use leaky feeder, very, very limited but they really uh, moved to voice over IP as the main form of uh, communication across the line. Um, so they have nearly pervasive Wi-Fi coverage at Chalapach. So uh, I don't know how many kilometers of, uh, of drift. It, it's, it, it's a lot. It's not a massive mine, but it's a, a decent sized mine. Uh, but every nook and cranny is lit up with Wi-Fi. Um, towards the bottom of the diagram, you'll see that uh, there's a little orange box. This is something we call the wireless extender. And it allows us to extend Wi-Fi coverage in the area of the mine where, in my opinion, it matters most, and that's in the heading, at the face, in the stove. And that really um, is, is designed to be portable, battery-powered. Uh, this design gets you through about uh, six shifts, so we'll get about three days of runtime on it at, uh, at full load. And the reason that they use these in the heading is because throughout the mining cycle, when you drill and blast and muck, infrastructure gets damaged. Uh, you don't want to have permanent infrastructure in, in that heading. So having something that you can temporarily move in and out allows you to extend, extend the comms to that area without uh, damaging the equipment. Uh, we're showing a jumbo, but this could be, very well be a loader or a haul truck. Um, or there's tablets installed on, on their vehicles. And again, this is their means of implementing short interval control. Uh, most of the uh, the prime movers is Sandvik equipment, and Sandvik was a partner in helping to uh, develop the technology uh, based on their Optimine solution. So that's kind of a snapshot of, of what you see, and I'll kind of break it down into into different components. It's very slow to move that slide on my side here, Darren. There we go. So the enabling technology at Chalapach, the what? So if we go back to the previous diagram, uh, today at Chalapach there's about 400 of these fixed access points along their main travel ways, along their haulage roads, uh, all the way up to the stope, as close to the stope as they can get where the permanent infrastructure doesn't get damaged. Uh, there's about 16 uh, battery-powered portable Wi-Fi extenders. These extenders are uh, essentially uh, a uh, Pelican style case with a battery management system that uh, Dundee designed and a uh, commercial off the shelf access point that provides 5 gigahertz backhaul connectivity to the main network and 2.4 gigahertz connectivity to the client devices like RFID tags, voice over IP phones, IP cameras, uh, telemetry equipment, tablets, and so on. There's about 18 communications, or pardon me, 180 communication gateways uh, deployed throughout the mine, about 330 VoIP uh, phones. Uh, that's a mix of portable hands, uh, handsets, and it's also a mix of vehicle kits. They're a modified version of, of the handset, so they have a speaker on it and a lapel mic, and the guys can use it uh, very similar to a two-way radio. There's about 670 RFID tags uh, deployed, uh, either powered from mobile equipment or different uh, assets that move throughout the mine, and the balance of those are installed in the uh, cap lamps of the individuals. So if you look at their, their initial kickoff of this journey in 2009 to 2012, this is what they were able to achieve. They were able to know in near real time where their people were, where their assets were, communicate with their people using voice over IP, Communicate in the heading, which is traditionally data dark, and there's no comms. The guy normally has to walk out of the stove in order to get on the leaky feeder system to talk to someone in, in dispatch or, or the central control room. They're able to push tasks to the, the individuals at the face using their tablets, and they're able to get that feedback mechanism for, from those tablets. So it's actually quite impressive, um, really, for a little wee mining company with this little wee mine in Bulgaria 
that they were able to do this a lot better than a lot of uh, suppliers, myself included, were able to do in the years that I was focused on it. So it really is a great success story in my opinion. This talks a little bit about the individual components. I've kind of already spoken about it. This is uh, sort of what they look like. Sorry, I'll go back a slide. The communications gateway is a network switch in a power distribution module. It kind of hangs on the wall. Uh, you'll see a picture in a later slide that actually uh, shows you what they look like. The little TIE fighter thing that you can see, that's our access point. Again, it's just a low cost commercial off the shelf AP in a rugged enclosure. There's a little dot that you'll see on the lid. That's actually a status light. So from a troubleshooting standpoint, if I have uh, no offense to the miners in the room, the knuckle dragging miners that aren't technology guys can look at the status light and know, yes, it works, no, it doesn't work. And then they can engage someone in IT or someone uh, in the central control room that can diagnose what the problem may be. There's these four yellow masks and these directional patch antennas that really, from a deployment standpoint, allow us to uh, direct the RF in the direction that we want. So we can move this at a crosscut, we can have it hitting kind of four sections of the crosscut, or have two antennas focusing the RF energy into two different directions in the drift. And uh, I have very little movement or no movement of, of those antennas, which is part of the problem in a lot of deployments. And then you have the Wi-Fi extender, which I spoke about. The original extender that was deployed uh, at Chelopetch uh, looks similar to this, only it was in a, uh, a metal case. It had external antennas. It was a great idea, a good concept. It was uh, a little awkward to carry because the antennas kind of fold up. So the guys, when they go into the heading, what they do is they'll use kind of a, a cap hook or a J hook and hang it on the screen and just kind of flop the antennas down. Now, if you have to walk a kilometer into the heading, these things are kind of heavy. So at Terrative, part of what we did is we changed the design to take those antennas and put them inside of the enclosure just to make sure that the, the, uh, the guy that was carrying it uh, ergonomically was a little easier for them to deploy, and then you have to worry about antennas getting damaged. Some of the other components, um, voice over IP. So this was a, a modified off-the-shelf voice over IP handset. In this case, it was a Cisco handset. Uh, we built a little uh, encapsulating envelope that went on top of it that provided an additional battery, so you got longer, a longer runtime, and it provided an interface to a lapel push-to-talk microphone. And one of the companies that I worked for actually made a very similar product, and the, the thinking behind it was most of the folks in the mining industry are used to leaky feeder, and they're used to that lapel mic, they get on the mic, and they can uh, broadcast whatever the message and uh, that's kind of the, the ergonomic feel that they have. So when you transition from leaky feeder to voice over IP, it was really making sure that they could still operate that the same way that they want. So if they want to use the lapel mic and broadcast, they can do so. If they wanted to have a private call and dial an extension on surface or dial a supplier over in Canada for their mine in Bulgaria, they can do so as well. Again, that same phone was modified to uh, almost look like a car stereo that was mounted inside of a vehicle. There's a speaker installed inside of that box and a lapel mic. So very similar to what you'd see in, uh, in a vehicle, uh, VHF or UHF radio. And then for those of you that are familiar with communications uh, uh, in underground mines, uh, quite often what you'll see is uh, these Femco phones, it's these hardwire analog phones. So DPM said, we want something similar, but we want it to be based on voice over IP. And there's a couple models that they had. One of them was actually just a hardwired, so it would be CAT6 running from one of those communication gateways or from a network switch that would power this phone. When the phone would ring, there's a little strobe light on the top that would uh, signal that there's a call coming in. And in some cases, we had a, a, a Wi-Fi module that would allow us to connect wirelessly to uh, the backbone. So those are the core components. Now, after the merger with MineRP, and we looked at our strategy and going to market, and we realized there's a lot of people that provide specific solutions that already do this. And the question was, do we want to compete with folks that do that? Or do we want to take the stance of, we don't want to build our own access points. Let's just partner with people that do this every day. And rather focus on the gaps in the market. 
So initially, our product offering represented all the things that I showed you, but really today, it's starting to look a little bit different. We're not in the access point business. We do provide, as an enabling technology for MineRP, uh, a wireless extender. Uh, it's something that allows us to extend the Wi-Fi coverage into the heading. There aren't a lot of solution providers that have this. Uh, so we'd rather partner with them, have them provide the main infrastructure, have them provide some of these key elements that we require as the overall value proposition of the solution, and fill in the gaps with some of the hardware that's missing. So that's our strategy going forward. Again, it speaks to the, the, the spirit of collaboration and really, uh, I think, the the mind shift that both the supplier side and the mining side has, has seen. And we've started to build a number of good partnerships with, with providers. So we're running a little short on time. I'd like to make sure we have time for questions. So uh, I just want to get you into the, the, the next piece of your, uh, your presentation. If we can, that'd be great. No problem. See, my problem there, because I could probably talk all day about this stuff. No, you can. That's all right. All right. Uh, let me skip ahead a little bit here, guys. Kind of get to uh, some of the meat and potatoes. There, can you maybe move the slides in here? Yep. It might be a little bit quicker. Probably going to skip through a couple. Uh, let, let, let's hang on this one for a second. Okay. So, really, if you kind of take the, the what I told you a little bit about the journey, uh, kind of where we, we were, where we were 12 years ago in terms of bringing this technology to market, where the market was at our understanding of what was important for the market, so it was that golden circle, the how, the what, and the why. These are things that I think uh, everyone on the call that's, that's, that's looking at digitization for their operations and give some consideration to. It's not an exhaustive, exhaustive list, but uh, I, I think it's fairly important. So I would say, you know, leveraging what I've learned at Dundee, uh, it, it's critical to have a very clearly articulated why. Why are you going down this journey? And then you can look at uh, the how and the what. So you don't have to select the technology right out of the gate. Let's try to get an understanding of what problems we're trying to solve. Right? Uh, when you go down this journey, how do you measure success? How do you know you did the right thing? I've deployed uh, a pile of Wi-Fi systems, and I've gone back to those customers and said, okay, well, were we successful? Well, it's hard to gauge success when you didn't really have a success criteria because you were innovators and you just wanted shiny new toys underground. So it's very difficult to justify the investment and expansion unless you have a very clearly articulated reason for it. So that's why you want to start with your why. Uh, I think it's really critical to understand who your stakeholders are. Your stakeholders aren't going to be the IT guys, right? Uh, they'll be supporting this. It's going to be your geologists. It's going to be uh, your operations guys. It's going to be your surveyors. It's going to be a number of stakeholders that all have to get around the table and articulate what their why is and then find that common why and make sure that you've got support from the executive all the way down to the stakeholders to make sure that this is a success. And this is probably one of the painful journeys that, uh, that I've endured, uh, certainly in the, in the early years of deploying these systems, is uh, we put all of our eggs in one basket and then you have someone that changes and you didn't have a really good business justification for doing it and, and the project really dies on the line. So you know, make sure that you've got those things carved out uh, well before. Um, where do you need coverage, right? So um, even though I've been in the, the Wi-Fi business, I, I'll be the first to tell you, you don't need pervasive Wi-Fi in your mind. You absolutely don't. Um, I would have told you that you did because I was selling Wi-Fi, but if you understand the business problem and you understand where you need the data, it's okay to have hotspot coverage. And there's areas where you need to have that coverage. And in my opinion, it's going to be in hotspots on your main travel ways. It's going to be at the stop and the heading. Those are critical areas where that data that impacts business is absolutely required. So I focus on those areas. But again, it needs to align with the problems that you're trying to solve within your own organization. When you deploy Wi-Fi, I think uh, it's critical to understand how the RF uh, propagates in your mind. Uh, I've done Wi-Fi deployments in salt mines, potash mines, hard rock mines, uh, nickel mines, copper, zinc mines, and they all behave differently. They behave differently because of the, uh, the type of rock where the signal is propagating. Uh, salt, for example, in potash, the RF signal just carries and carries and carries. You get fantastic coverage with Wi-Fi. You get into a Zeke mine and you get very poor coverage. So if you're aiming for voice over IP and you require a high density uh, of, of access points, you need a lot of them versus a potash or salt mine. So that site survey is critical. The big part of the site survey is not just understanding how the RF signal propagates throughout the mine, but it's understanding when I design the system, 
what am I dealing with physically in the environment? If I've got other infrastructure that I can't run a cable across, I've got to account for the fact that I need another 25 meters to go around a corner. I've got to account for the fact that maybe uh, I've got bad ground in this area and I can't run some of the infrastructure there, so I've got to find another path. So, you know, understanding the physical environment, understanding the business challenges, understanding the single propagation, those are key things that, that you've got to carve out. And part of this is really making sure that when you look at the stakeholders and the requirements, that as the mining organization that's going to deploy this thing, and this is one aspect of your, your journey towards digital, you've got someone that manages this project. You need someone assigned and accountable to ensuring that all of those stakeholders' interests are covered off. Other things to look at are, you know, how easy it is it to maintain? How easy is it to install? Who's going to do the maintenance? Who's going to do the installation? How critical is this going to be to the ongoing operations of my business? That speaks to redundancy. You can design a network and you don't have to have redundancy, but if the nature of the network is providing you data that's an integral part of your decision making, you have to think about redundancy and continuity. Managing the change. Uh, this is a big thing. And one of the first questions I asked Rick is I said, you know, how did you guys do it? And he said, yeah, yeah, we just did this Wi-Fi stuff. And he almost trivialized uh, the Wi-Fi stuff. But managing the change is probably the biggest uh, challenge that they had. And, and if Rick were on the call, he'd tell you the same thing. So they spent two years on change management. And it mm -hmm. was really, you know, making sure that culturally their people were important, that they understood what's in it for them, uh, that they understood that it wasn't Big Brother watching. Because there isn't a mind on the planet that's got a team of people that sit to watch people, right? That's not what they're in business for. They're they're there to make sure that we've got a plan, we're executing on the plan. If we can't execute as planned, then we need to make changes. That's the motivation. That's the why. And if that why is clearly articulated all the way down the rank and file, you will have fantastic support. And Rick Howes, uh, I think, really epitomizes the success of change management and, and the why in doing that. You've got to make sure that the technology is reliable. It's got to work. It's got to do what it says. Uh, you've got to hold people accountable. You've got to continuously improve. You've got to make sure that you're managing your resources. You've got to make sure that everyone understands what their role is in, in the big picture. So the social aspect uh, probably isn't drawn to scale in this diagram, but it, it, it's probably the most significant one, I would say. And Derek, from your experience uh, as, as change management agents, uh, you, you'd probably agree with that statement. Yeah, we, we absolutely agree with that, and uh, we've seen the same sort of thing, so it's nice to see that uh, that Rick and the team at Dundee recognize that and, and that they put so much effort into that, and I think that probably is a, a big uh, part of why they were success, so successful. Yep, yep. Uh, Derek, can you um, maybe uh, try to nudge it forward for me? There we go. Um, this talks very briefly about MineRP. Again, I won't get into the details of, of, of MineRP ad nauseum, but really MineRP is in the data business. And uh, fundamentally what we want to do with MineRP is make sure that we have the connectivity that allows us to collect data from the face, that allows us to collect data from environmental sensors, from mobile equipment, uh, from the over 300 disparate systems that are used across the various disciplines in mining, amalgamate that data, put it together, contextualize it, add different attributes and spatial context so that we have a holistic view of the operation. We use that data to marry the business of mining with the science of mining. And really, I think it's, it's quite a unique value proposition, and this fundamentally is why the marriage of, of, of uh, MineRP and Teradive came to be. Go okay. ahead, Derek, I'll let you move that one forward a bit. Um, this talks a little bit about the intelligent mine. Um, really at MineRP, I think part of our mandate is uh, we believe that the future of mining is digitization and we want to build the intelligent mine. The intelligent mine is really founded on a bunch of things. And Derek, if you can move the slide forward, I'll kind of speak to the next slide uh, and, and wrap these two up together. The intelligent mine really is a, a, a collection of intelligent workplaces. The intelligent workplace is a connected workplace that has intelligent equipment, things like onboard management systems, things like uh, you know, RFID, things like telemetry, things like tablets and voice communication. Uh, you've got the extension of the connected workplace by having the connected worker. Again, it's, it, it's arming that connected worker maybe with uh, you know, biometric sensors so that we can understand the challenges of mining at depth uh, with, with, with heat and ventilation uh, using tablets and voice over IP. 
And these are the building blocks that are going to allow us to provide the connectivity, to collect the data, to move this into MineRP, and provide spatial context into the intelligent place of work, and make better decisions, not just from surface, but also move some of that decision-making to the edge. So we want to tease out the concept of what we're calling the intelligence spatial edge computer. And for those of you that have been on this digitization track and, and, and you hear what, what, you know, the likes of Deloitte and e &Y and uh, a number of other thought leaders are, are, are talking about, edge computing and artificial intelligence, <clears throat> pardon me, are all part and parcel of what we're trying to tie into the ecosystem to enable the intelligent mind. You should go ahead, Derek, if you could. And this is essentially the, the same idea. This is a kind of a representation of what Chelepech may look like or what a digital mind may look like. Um, along the bottom, you have the network backbone, and this speaks to one of the partnerships that we've, uh, that we've uh, identified uh, at Teradev with another great subway company called uh, Maestro Digital uh, Mine. They've got a great alternative to fiber, far more cost effective, very easy to deploy provides a lot of the uh, functionality that we had with our power distribution, with our redundancy at a fraction of the cost. So again, it speaks to the ecosystem and pulling in the ecosystem to provide uh, the best of breed technologies to solve the problem. In the stopes or in the headings, we recognize we can't put permanent infrastructure. So this is where the notion of the, the extender or the portable Wi-Fi node comes into play. Uh, it's really about bridging connectivity to that intelligent place of work and enabling all the applications that uh, that we talked about. And then the, the edge computer is the other device that we illustrate there. Our view is we don't want to take all this data and move it up the stack, right, or move it to the cloud. Because if you look at the volume of data that we collect, it's just, it's just too much to process, and we don't need to move it up, up, up the chain. So if we can move some of the intelligence, some, some of the analytics into the place of work, and if you sever connectivity, those intelligent things, that intelligent equipment knows where it needs to go and drill next. The worker who is enabled by that edge device knows what he needs to do next and can provide that feedback mechanism regardless of connectivity because we've enabled the intelligence at the heading in the store. So that's the concept that we're moving towards with the enablement of the intelligent place of work. Go ahead, Derek, if you could. Yes, please. <laughs> Uh, so second last slide, this, uh, many of you that, uh, that attended Minds of Technology in Toronto back in the fall last year, Rick House gave a presenta presentation that demonstrated um, taking the lid off a cello patch. And this was a live feed to uh, one of the active headings underground in Bulgaria. We had the, the jumbo operator on video talking to him, voice over IP from uh, 400 meters underground in Bulgaria in the little village of cello patch all the way back to Toronto. Uh, we could see the telemetry that, uh, that was on his drill. We could see the drill pattern uh, as he was drilling. And uh, we can do this anywhere that we had connectivity. So again, this is the foundation and the building block of what the digitization journey was for Dundee and uh, evidence of, of what that might look like. Go ahead, Derek, if you could, please. Last slide, really, I think these are things that I'd like to leave you with, uh, things to ponder, takeaways. Um, you know, if I can give you any counsel based on my experience over the last 12 years, I would say, you know, start with why. Uh, take a page from Simon Sinek. You know, if you understand your why, if you understand your passion, it's a lot easier to execute on your how and your what. And that's true if you're a mining organization. That's true if you're a supplier. Uh, so starting with your why is, is a great way to do that. Focus on addressing the problems that you're that you're trying to solve. Right? Putting Wi-Fi in for the sake of Wi-Fi doesn't fix anything, unless there's a direct correlation to your value chain. Right? So if it impacts the value chain and it affects your business outcome, then I think it's a project that's worth uh, that's worth pursuing. These are Rick's words: Technology doesn't cure it. Technology is only an enabler, and I would dare say that Wi-Fi is not necessarily the be-all, end-all, and the cure for everything that ails uh, mining with respect to the adoption of technology. So 
So, you know, from a technology standpoint, I think you need to look at what the problems that you're trying to solve. Where do you need that connectivity? Where do you need the data? So you need the data from the right place at the right time in front of the right people to drive the right decision making. That's really the goal. Build your plan about, uh, around that. And that will dictate sort of technology that you go with. So Wi-Fi is a great, very scalable technology, but in some cases it may not be the technology that fits the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, we're starting to see the emergence of LTE. Uh, LTE's had its place in mining for, for, for a number of years. Surface, but there's a number of examples now of money organizations that have taken LTE underground. Mm -hmm. uh, low power wide area network is a very cost effective, easy to deploy uh, communication mechanism that allows us to have hundreds and hundreds of sensors out there that are all providing uh, information in near real time. And it's, it's a fraction of the cost of, of Wi Fi and, and LTE. Mm -hmm. Again, just Reiterate pervasive coverage, I think, is a common misconception. Uh, focus on connectivity where it's needed. The right data at the right time for the right people. Uh, collaboration and leverage the ecosystem. I think uh, that's the theme in mining and digitization, and I would uh, certainly encourage you out there uh, along this journey to, to really give some thought as to who you're working with. And uh, there isn't one company that can do it all. There's lots of great companies that have lots of great solutions that together can, can help address the industry solutions. Absolutely. I think that's our last slide, Derek. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, that. That collaboration piece, I know, you know, you and I met uh, through some of these things that are put on by CMIC. Uh, GMSG are great places to collaborate and share experience. I'm involved with a lot of those, as I know you are. Um, so I really, uh, I really, uh, you know, sort of second the, the comment there. There's a, a lot of people out there and, and they should be working together on some of these things for sure. Yep. Yeah. And I, I really like, um, you know, your, your, your comment on the why. Um, that's something that, you know, we've seen with some clients that we work with, um, you know, where they, they don't necessarily know the problem they're trying to solve. They just feel like they need to get, get on this digital thing, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, you know, you really need to understand what your why is and, and what problems you're trying to solve and then find the solutions that, that work best. Um, I'd like to open it up to some questions now. We've got a few minutes for those of you who are still on. I think most people have stuck around. I appreciate that. Um, we've got uh, the chat window. If, if anyone has any questions, uh, we'll take them for Joe now. Just uh, go into your chat window, type in your question, and uh, I will try to, uh, to get those answered by Joe take as many as we can right now. Joe, I, I just uh, I appreciate the again the, the comments on uh, change were, were interesting for me based on uh, what we do and where we fit into the, the puzzle. Um, you know what what have you seen as, as the biggest um, the biggest area of resistance in, in some of the work that you've done? Uh, it's uh, it's funny. We uh, we we deploy a system or a small proof of concept system, and uh, we circle back with the client after the installation. Uh, we would try to guide the installation ourselves because there was uh, the fear of Big Brother watching. And uh, I get a call every once in a while, and the customer would say, ah, "Your your stuff doesn't work." I'd say, "Okay, well, help me understand what, what the problem is." Well, it won't connect. Okay, well, it won't connect. Uh, have you had a look to see if the antenna is still intact? And they'd go down and say. Yeah, it looks like uh, there's a clean cut on the antenna. So if, if the guys didn't want to be tracked or if they didn't want the, uh, the, the vehicle telemetry being collected, you'd go and you see a very clean cleavered uh, <laughs> cable on the antenna. So really, I think for us, it was, uh, okay, let's be, aware, let's be aware of some of the cultural challenges and the, the, the misperceptions. Let's make sure we articulate what's in it for the individuals. It's not about Big Brother watching. Um, and then also, let's look at how we can install this to make it a bit more minor proof. So if you make it very easy for it to be sabotaged, it's going to be sabotaged. If people don't believe in the technology, it will never be successful. It doesn't matter how great the technology is. No, you're you're absolutely right, and uh, and we see that as well. And, and with the with the work that we've done with some of our clients, um, that same sort of uh, big brother comment, and and you know the 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 uh, the idea that that somebody's going to be watching their every move, and you know, and and we try to reiterate to people that people people don't have the time to watch what you're doing every, every minute of the day it's just uh you know people are too busy and mining is is a busy 
busy business and everybody has has more important things to do than than uh, keep watching uh, what people are doing and making sure that they're doing the right things at the right time um, yeah I just don't uh, don't see that that happening anywhere <laughs> that's great okay um, I don't have uh, too many questions coming in I just like to uh, as I'm waiting I'll wait for a couple more um, presentations uh, or sorry questions um, and uh, actually we've got something here uh, excellent presentation looking forward to forward looking path for mining companies it's great to understand how Rick House doubled production and cut his costs in half short interval control is just getting information and acting on it as it happens appreciate that Michael um, thank you for that uh, if we uh, don't have any questions, I'd just like to, uh, I mentioned a little earlier for those who are on, um, our next, uh, our next, uh, session in the Changing Minds webinar series is, uh, is with Ken Schroeder. It's coming up, uh, Thursday, April 26th. There's a new time for those of you who have already registered. Hopefully you caught the new time. It's at 1.30 in the afternoon. Um, I will, uh, jump. I do have a, a couple questions here. Um, we'll jump back for you there, Joe. Um, with sure. respect to why, who is currently managing, coordinating all the feedback from stakeholders in a very complex mine operation? Yeah, no, I think, I think it's a good question. And, you know, from, from a supplier standpoint, I think that's that's the challenge that we've got on the sales and customer engagement standpoint is at what level are you selling? And, uh, you know, we've had success selling from the bottom up. And uh, your mileage really varies with it because you can do a great job selling on the bottom up, but if it doesn't tie into a broader uh, vis vision or a bigger why, uh, it doesn't go very far. So from mine RP standpoint, uh, the thought is work in collaboration with partners that have access to the decision makers at a strategic level. That's the CEOs, that's the CEOs. And that's where the conversation is, is starting for us with, with, with those partners. Now, at some point, um, we have to have a conversation with, with different stakeholders within the organization. So I don't think there's an easy answer, but our approach from the minor piece standpoint kind of starts at that level. It's a C-level discussion. It's understanding what the why is, how we can transform your business, and then you start to assemble a project team within the organization from each of the stakeholder groups that's tasked with the execution of that vision. That's great. It really ties into the kind of the next question that that, that was there as well. Is um, do you see more more pushing or pulling requirements from the stakeholders themselves? Do the stakeholders understand what the technology can deliver with respect to their why, or are you trying to show them all the time what what it can do for them? It's. Uh, I mean, if you would have asked me the question uh, two years ago, I would have given you a different answer, right? It was. Yeah. I think it was certainly much more of a push. Uh, I think it's a bit more of a pull now, just because of the the hyper awareness in the industry of in terms of where the industry is at, and the the need to do something different. So the cat's out of the bag. Everyone's aware of it now. Whether or not they're ready and prepared for that is is a different matter. Um, but you know, I'm I'm pleased and I'm encouraged to see uh, just through a, a lot of the workshops you and I have participated in together in some of the different forums. Uh, that collaboration, we're seeing more and more people at the table, and I think what the industry needs is more forums to do so, just to kind of get the word out there and say, you know, you don't have to do this on your own, guys. Uh, there are more and more people that have that have done this. Uh, and the awareness is certainly growing. So I don't know if that answers the question, but I think that just kind of speaks to the state of the union today versus a couple of years ago. I think it does answer the question. I appreciate that. Well, that's great. Okay, well, uh, we're getting close to uh, our, uh, our, our time there. And uh, I'd like to thank you once again, uh, Joe. Uh, I think that was the last question we had. Uh, thanks again for your time. Um, you know, we're, we're going to keep having these webinars. I hope they're useful to people. I think, uh, you know, this is our way of contributing to the collaboration. It's trying to get people like yourselves uh, on these webinars to share their information and, and share their knowledge and, and experience. And uh, so, again, uh, anyone who's on the call, we encourage you to uh, keep tuning in and, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll keep bringing you uh, great presentations like uh, the one Joe did today. Appreciate your time again, Joe. Thank you very much and appreciate everybody for attending.
Thank you, Derek. Thanks, everyone. All right. Have a great day, everyone.